Brethren, there's a lot going on in the world right now, a tremendous amount going on in the news. Uh, I wanted to begin this sermon this afternoon commenting on some of the things going on and just a few brief comments. Some of these things will be items that you have noticed. Perhaps uh, some of the details have passed us by. As you know, my birth nation is England, or more accurately, the United Kingdom, birth kingdom, birth country is England, birth kingdom is the United Kingdom, and Brexit is coming about six weeks from now, officially, the date of the departure of the United Kingdom from the European Union is now slated for about, for about, for October 31st. They're talking about the Halloween departure of the Brits from the European Union. This has been a deeply fraught matter in both Britain and in continental Europe, and it's unclear at present what's going to happen. It's something for us to keep an eye on. The Church of God has felt, and I think this is true for decades, that the ultimate uh, entity which we know will arise in Europe, which is going to look really quite different from the European Union, will not include the Anglo-Saxon nations, Britain in particular, uh, we don't know what will happen. So in a sense, the departure of the United Kingdom has not come as a surprise. Uh, these next six weeks will be very interesting, something to keep an eye on. Uh, you're probably aware that the big stumbling block in organizing some kind of a program, some kind of a method for the Brits to leave the European Union has been, has been Ireland the island of Ireland off to the west of the main Ireland of the United Kingdom is in fact two nations, uh, two countries, the Republic of Ireland and, the, uh, uh, and Northern Ireland, which is part of the United Kingdom. And it becomes a problem because if you put a physical border there, it means once again uh, customs checks and passport checks perhaps and as I think you're probably aware, Ireland has been very, very troubled, was very, very troubled by religious uh, conflict for decades, actually. Things calmed down around 1998, around the time of the Good Friday Peace Agreement. If you put a hard border between the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland, the thought is there may be a return to sectarian strife. The other thought is that you then block what is in effect uh, a passage where a lot of trade and commerce passes. Right now, if you were to drive across that border, you would barely notice it. There are no customs checks. You just drive straight across because both the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland are part of the European Union. So this has been the big sticking point, and Prime Minister Boris Johnson expressed cautious optimism this week from continental Europe there are comments that are perhaps a little less optimistic, but it remains to be seen. It's going to be very hard on everyone, including continental Europe and the uh, United Kingdom, economically, if the United Kingdom leaves with no trading agreement. So that's something for us to keep our eyes on. Uh, another item that's been in the news this week that you may have caught is the elections in the state of Israel. Uh, Israeli politics are quite a thing. They have... Um, uh, they have a system that is very different from the system that we have here in the United States or even the system in the United Kingdom. They have what's called proportional representation. What that means is that each party says, well, we put, we're putting forward so many candidates and they count the number of votes in the nation as a whole and then apportion the seats according to how many votes in the nation as a whole, not just one district or one constituency. Well, the result of this second round of elections that just took place was very close to a dead heat. 33 to 31, there's the new centrist coalition that has been termed blue and white, led by a former army general whose name is Benny Gantz, and they got, as I read on the news this morning, 33 seats. And the Likud, the right-wing party that has been governing for quite a long time now, came out with 31 seats. 120 seats in the Israeli Knesset. You've got to have 61, or you really can't govern. Back in April, there was a round of elections, and the numbers were very, very close to the way they've come out this time around. But for the first time in the history of the state of Israel, it proved impossible to form a coalition government. So they went back to the people and placed another vote there, and it's come out uh, 
close to kind of a deadlock. In the news today, they're saying the Israeli president is going to try to get them to form a cross-party alliance. The president is, he has basically a ceremonial role. Everybody get together, all the secular parties, and form a cross-party alliance. So Israel has become divided, as has Britain, as is this country, frankly, uh, along political lines, but also along religious lines, because the reason that they were not able to form a, a coalition government back in April was the fact that one of the ultra-religious parties uh, would have liked to be part of the coalition government, and one of the right-wing secular parties said no, we will not participate in a coalition with the religious. You may not realize this, but one religious group in Israel has an exemption from military service. They're referred to as the Haredi, and they're the ultra-religious, and they get an automatic except exemption. And not surprisingly, many other Israelis are saying, well, this isn't fair. Why should they get an automatic ex exemption? You know, there are others who say, well, I'm religious, but I don't get an exemption from military service, which is required for all Jewish Israelis. So it's, again, another thing to, to keep our eyes on. They will be jockeying to form a coalition. And as I said, there are 120 seats in the Israeli Knesset. Uh, the other detail that needs to be watched and interesting in this round of elections is that there was a united Arab list. Um, Arab parties, uh, you may not realize, but Arabs constitute about 20% of the people in the state of Israel. But their parties have been fractured all over the map. Uh, some nationalists, some communists, some social democratic. This time around, they formed a united list, and they came up with, I think, 13 elected members to the Israeli Knesset. Now, the detail here is that if you have a secular coalition that comes to power, then it's very likely that the official opposition with 13 or perhaps 14 seats becomes the Arab parties, and then they get access to some rather sensitive uh, defense uh, information and so on, uh, security information. So uh, this is something to keep our eyes on as well. There's a lot going on. I had a conversation with Mr. Cecil Moranville at the wedding uh, last weekend, and he commented, he made, made a comment to me, he said, uh, uh, it's interesting to watch how many of these countries have 50-50 splits. And I thought, I hadn't thought about it that way. But it's true. Israel, the United Kingdom, and let's be frank, this country as well, where uh, the whole matter of some of the po political disagreements have become deeply polarizing. 50-50 splits. Uh, kingdom divided, Matthew 12, verse 25. Matthew 12 and verse 25, just over the page in our Bibles. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. So let's watch some of the things going on in the news. Other things in the news this week, the bombing of the Saudi oil installations. And um, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says that he, the United States is now going to begin delivering advanced weaponry to Saudi Arabia and to the Emirates with the possibility of action against Iran. The Iranian foreign minister says they're ready for war if need be. And we have a lot else going on on the world stage. Rise in populism. Germany is something as well for us to keep our eyes on. We've felt for many, many years, and I'm sure this is true, that Germany is at the center of European politics and will be in Bible prophecy. Something that has taken place in Germany that I hope has not escaped our attention is that now the biggest opposition party is an extreme right-wing party. Uh, I won't try to pronounce, my German is not very good. Auf für Deutschland. Somebody will come up to me after services and say, you pronounce it well, uh, badly. I, I do Spanish, I don't do German. But uh, the extreme right-wing party is now the biggest opposition party in Germany because there there's a coalition as well between the center-left social democrats and the center-right Christian democrats, both losing support to the ultra-right party. This is the first time since 1945 that an extreme right-wing party has taken that kind of a role in the German Bundestag. So again, we need to keep our eyes on some of these populist movements going on in the world. Uh, China also beginning to flex its muscles. There's a lot of talk in the news at present about trade and tariffs, uh, the United States and China. Russia, um, the uh, bear that stopped hibernating. I love uh, 
uh, Neil Hogberg's way that he expressed it in the, in the article that we had on the website. The Russian bear that has come out of hibernation also to be watched and some of the things going on in Hong Kong. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world as we get ready for the Feast of Tabernacles and most of it is not good. And you know, sometimes the sheer pace of events of things going on in the world pushes out last week's event from our uh, consciousness. What happened last week seems like ancient history because things are moving so fast. So if you haven't guessed, the sermon is about the subject of prophecy. I thought what I'd like to do in this sermon today is to get back to some basics. I've titled the sermon, Prophecy, a Review of the Basics. When I look around the Dallas congregation, I know many of, of, of you are really quite well informed and watch, like to watch what's going on in the news, and others, well, perhaps not quite so well informed. Uh, sometimes people almost take the position that they, they're gonna pay attention when it impacts their lives. But there are ways for us to watch Bible prophecy unfolding in the news, and you don't have to be a world news junkie like me. I'm a world news junkie and I watch things going on in the news all the time, but we do have to watch. Now, as I was thinking about preparing this message, I realized something, I think this needs to be mentioned here, that talking about the subject of what's going on in the world and Bible prophecy has been made more difficult in God's church because our nation has become very badly polarized. You know that and I know that. People have gone off in different directions screaming at one another that this political party or this particular political group is to blame for all the problems and the right screams at the left, they're all bad guys, and the left screams at the right, they're all bad guys, and of course we've had enormous controversy about the man who is the current president and the previous president, and the nation has become very polarized, and to some extent the church has become polarized as well. You've only got to listen to the conversations that sometimes take place over coffee and when we have our snacks after services, and you realize that we've become very polarized in the church of God. I want to suggest something. In actual fact, we really ought not to be. You ever thought about it? We really ought not to be. Why? Well, we're all Christians. And that carries in its wake certain obligatory views about all of the list of things that have become so controversial and so uh, damaging. Sometimes even when we talk among ourselves and we get upset with people's views. We're all opposed to abortion right? Right? Yes. We're all opposed to homosexuality, right? Right? Yes, because the Bible tells us so. But I think it's also worth keeping in mind that we're also all opposed to greed, right? We're also all opposed to prejudice against different racial groups. We're also all opposed, I hope, to lies and dirty tricks you noticed any of that going on in the news recently? Just maybe a little bit of all of that going on. So there is a sense in which we should not be divided by the things going on in our culture and the things going on around us. Sometimes because of our cultural background, we go to the right or we go to the left. It's to a great extent cultural. But I wanted to make some suggestions about watching what's going on in the world. Um, that, and that is when we get world news, it's probably best for us to stay in the center, to stay in the center as a feed for world news. Uh, some in the churches have become very uncritical about where they get their news from. You've only got to look at some of the things that people post on the social media, and it's just, it's just amazing. Some have no sense of watching things in a critical spirit. We should be careful where we get our news. We don't need to go out to the loony right or to the loony left, and we don't need to go to where the conspiracy theories are in order to get a good, sensible feed about what's going on in the world. Now, I hesitate to mention any particular news sources, because none of them are perfect, but I like to read the Wall Street Journal every day, and that's kind of a centrist, uh, maybe a little right of center, maybe a little left of center, but a very good source of news. I like to watch the BBC, or catch the BBC online. You get a, um, a different view, probably left of center, 
There are a number of other uh, sources of news that we can use, and some very good, uh, if you've got the time, read The Economist. It'll take you a lot of time to get through The Economist, but it's a very, very good news analysis uh, source of information. We need to be critical when we receive news about what's going on in the world. We need to check. We need to check, is it true? Um, I recently was friended by, you, know, you may not believe this, a gentleman who believes the earth is flat. And uh, yes, he is the leader of a flat earth church of God group. Now, if you didn't know that there was a flat earth church of God group, I congratulate you. <laughs> There is. <laughs> there is. I don't know how big it is, but he began sending me all this material over social media about how the earth is flat. And of course, sometimes when people get into these strange ideas, they dig their heels in. And he was not about to be talked out of the fact that the flat earth is, that the earth is not flat. And it is impossible for you to, or me to travel to the edge of the earth and look over the edge and fall off if we're not careful. But he was absolutely, he said he's got a degree in something or other, and he's a flat earth believer. Uh, I won't tell you the name of his organization, but there is a flat earth believing church of God. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. Gives us a principle that we really need to apply when we look at what's going on in the world. It's a very basic biblical principle. Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, and it's all the way throughout the Bible. Uh, this actually concerns judicial procedures, but it's uh, well applied um, in our consumption of news. It says, one witness shall not rise against the man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he com commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. Before we pass things on uncritically, let's check whether it's true or not. I, Maybe I'm not the only one here, but I'm sometimes just stunned by the way that people among the different Sabbath-keeping churches pass things along and traffic in news. And, and I want to say, have you stopped to check? This sounds wild. If it sounds wild, we need to stop and ask ourselves, is it wild? Is it true? We should have a worldview. We should have a worldview. But our worldview should be based on sources of news that are dependable, things that may be confirmed, things that come from responsible sources. And it shouldn't be hard for us to detect ax grinders on the left or on the right or from a religious pers perspective or the flat earthers. So let's be critical and let's not make the mistake of doing what so many people are doing these days. They're putting their ideology first and they're using their ideology as a filter for facts. No. It is facts first and ideology second. And if we read things that seem to contradict someone's ideology, the question still remains, is it true or not? Sometimes we have a particular view of things going on in the world and we read something and it seems to contradict our view. We don't reject it because it seems to contradict the way we view the world. We reject it if it is not true. I remember a number of years ago, uh, at Ambassador College um, when I was the director of an ambassador club and there was a young man he got up to give an attack speech and his attack speech was against socialized medicine and he began to talk about the National Health Service in the United Kingdom. Now I was born in England in a National Health Service hospital and I was actually born in a year when the uh, National Health Service came into existence and the incident of uh, of infant mortality went way down because of the National Health Service. They didn't tell him that at the time. Anyway, this young man got up and he began attacking the National Health Service and he began saying, all of the major parties in Britain are against the National Health Service. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, that is not true. That is not true. Now, whatever you may think about social, socialized medicine, at that point I had to get up and I, he didn't like it. He took him a bit of a shock when I said, you know, what you said is simply not true. But it serves as an illustration that we don't dismiss as fake news something that doesn't support our ideology. And you look around, you see all over this country, this is what's being done. It's fake news. Why? Why is it fake news? Well, it doesn't support my point of view. Well, is it true? Well, it's still fake news. 
Anything that contradicts my beliefs is fake news. I wanted to mention before getting into the body of, this, of the sermon here, something else that I think we really need, need to be careful about. I watch sometimes people's uh, publications on social media. Again, it's not a secret that within the political debate in this country, sometimes people publish things that can only be described as deeply vicious. I bet we've all read things like that. Vicious attacks on people I disagree with. And sometimes the vicious items get passed along. Again, we're the people of God. We are not vicious people. We need to think carefully before we pass along vicious, viciously expressed propaganda, whatever it may be, and put it onto social media. That's not who we are. We're the church of God. We are not vicious people. Okay, so with that said, as a rather long um, introduction, uh, I want to go through some points, some very basic points, sort of take us back to some of the basics of Bible prophecy, and um, we'll go through um, sometimes seven-point sermons are easier to take notes on. So it will be a seven-point sermon, and you'll know where I'm going. Point number one, and I think this is very, very important for us not to lose sight of as we watch what's going on in the world and we watch things getting worse and worse. Number one is that sin is the problem. Brethren, the problems that we face in our world are spiritual in nature. They are not primarily political. Sin is the problem. Now, I realize that when we say that, that doesn't excite us quite as much as saying, well, we think one particular political group is superior to another political group. Easier to raise the flag, sometimes, for political causes. But the fundamental problem is sin. Proverbs 14 and verse 34. Proverbs 14 and verse 34. In our culture, we are sinking into allowance of things that 20, 30 years ago would never have been countenance. We all know that. And yet sometimes when we stop and we consider that, we overlook it and we begin to analyze the world around us as if the problem were not spiritual. Proverbs 14, verse 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Sin is a reproach to any people. And bit by bit you see our nations, the nation where I was born and this nation where I've had the privilege of living for over 40 years now, bit by bit descending into certain practices that are allowed and the fabric of the family falling apart and people tolerating things that would not have been tolerated. Sin is the basic problem. Can you name the three major sins of Israel prior to the Babylonian exile? We heard in the sermonette a little bit about the Babylonian. Yes, the FI graduates can. The FI students can, because I emphasize it th that much in class. What were the three big sins of Israel prior to the time that Babylon came through, or Judah more specifically, came through and destroyed Judah and Jerusalem? There were three big sins. Number one, idolatry. And idolatry can be all kinds of things. It, can be it doesn't have to be worship of a wooden or metal thing. It can be worship of money. It can be worship of, uh, of uh, fame. It can be worship of all kinds of things. Number one, idolatry. Number two, Sabbath breaking. And number three, a breakdown in the social order. When we look into the prophets, we discover those big three. That was the reason God brought Israel and Judah down. Idolatry, Sabbath breaking, and a failure to take care of the little people within the society. Again, if that sounds familiar, well, it, I, th I think it is. We're seeing a reenactment of some of those things. The same thing's taking place. Isaiah 5 and verse 20. Isaiah 5 and verse 20. Isaiah 5 and verse 20. Isaiah here says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We live in a nation that has rapidly lost its way with regard to basic Judeo-Christian morality. People have become confused. It's all got turned upside down. 
And sometimes I know when your kids come home from school, you've got to sit down and discuss those things with them because there are certain agendas going on that are pushed very, very hard. Point number one, the basic problem is sin. The problem is sin. Point number two, con connected to this, and I think this is something for us to keep in mind, is that there's no salvation in politics. There is no salvation in politics. We don't have a King Hezekiah on the scene right now. And you know, sometimes I hear church people say, well, if only we could get rid of all the politicians. If we could only get rid of all the politicians, everything would be better. Is that true? Are politicians cut from a different cloth than the nation generally? Turn with me over the page in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Isaiah 1, verses 5 and 6. The prophet Isaiah back then in the 8th century BC made an interesting point, and his point was that back then Judah was going rotten from top to bottom. Isaiah 1, verse 5. Isaiah asked the rhetorical question, why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been clothed, closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. Isaiah uses very colorful language to highlight that point. He's saying everything's gone bad. Everything's gone bad. Now, I think there are some people in politics who are very well-intentioned. There are some who don't take bribes. There are some who don't abuse people. But um, in general, the point is in a nation like this, as the nation begins to go down, the leadership goes with it. It's not the one or the other. Hosea 4 and verse 9. Book of Hosea chapter 4 and verse 9. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 9, this has always struck me here. It's talking about the priesthood back then. Hosea, by the way, prophesied to northern Israel. Hosea 4, 4 and verse 9, Hosea says, And it shall be like people, like priests. So I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their deeds. Like people, like priests. The priests were the same as the people. The things going on among the priesthood were the same as the things going on among the people. When you really look at it, and you look at a nation like this, leadership tends to be cut from the same cultural cloth that the people are cut from. There is, therefore, no salvation in politics. Now, you, know, you could go back 20 years and say, well, maybe 20, 25 years ago, one party in power would have made much more of a difference in terms of the slide in morality and the slide in the way things are done. But frankly, some of those things are lost causes now, and it would be very, very difficult to put the brakes on in terms of the acceptance of alternate lifestyles and the acceptance of some of the things that go on in our society. Point number three, and I want, we're still talking about basics here. Point number three, let's go to Jeremiah 30 and verse seven. Jeremiah 30 and verse seven. Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. Jeremiah here is talking and he's prophesying about the time that is ahead of us, a very difficult time. And Jeremiah emphasizes something that we should never lose sight of. Jeremiah 30 and verse 7, he says, Alas, for that day is great. He's talking about the day of the Lord. So that none is like it. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. One of the things that we understand and we've understood for many, many years in the church of God is that God brings judgment on Israel first. The Israelite nations come in for God's judgment before the other nations. Why? Well, because the Israelite nations are the places where the Bibles were published, the places where religious freedom was granted, the places where the prosperity was. It's Israel first and then the other nations. Genesis 48 verse 16 Genesis chapter 48 and verse 16. Genesis 48, verse 16. A number of years ago, I, I had a question from a church member, actually in France. And this church member said, well, you know, why do we always talk about the United States and Britain as Israel? Uh, 
France is also an Israelite nation, which is true, or it is true to a great extent, perhaps not all of France. Why do we say that the time of Jacob's trouble will fall on the United States and Britain? I think the answer here is in Genesis 48 and verse 16, where Jacob blesses his two grandsons. Genesis 48 and verse 16. Now, the two grandsons, I'm not going to go into the doctrine. I assume you're familiar with the doctrine. If you're not, uh, you should read the uh, recent publication by the church on the United States and Britain in Bible prophecy. But here in this very famous scene, Jacob, this is where he crosses his hands and he pronounces a blessing on Ephraim and Manasseh. Let's pick it up here in Genesis 48 verse 15. And he blessed Joseph and he said, God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. And then he says something interesting. Let my name, Jacob, Israel, be named upon them and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. In other words, when we talk about Israel in the last days, we're talking about these two nations descended from Ephraim and Manasseh in particular. And it's been a very good thing that those nations have been dominant now for about 70 years, from, or longer than that, frankly, from the end of the Second World War and prior to that. But bit by bit, now on the world scene, and again, this is something we need to keep our eyes on, the loss of Israelite leadership on the world scene. Nature hates a vacuum. It will be filled by someone. It will be filled by something. Bit by bit, the United States of America, now the leading Israelite nation, and Europe, continental Europe in particular, are increasingly at odds. Here's a quote, you may have read this. This is November last year, November 6, 2018. Emmanuel Macron, the uh, president of France, was touring the World War I war memorials, and he called for the formation of a real European army to protect the continent with respect to China, Russia, and even the United States of America. Now, that's quite a thing to be saying. Since the Second World War, the US and Western Europe have been allies. Now there's uh, some unease. Can we rely on the United States to protect us? They're going in different ways on many different things, trade, Iran, the climate accord, Agence France Presse reports that while on, the tour, on a tour of World War I memorials, Macron said, we will not protect the Europeans unless we decide to have a true European army. Now, of course, there's been a reluctance to rearm in Western Europe, in many Western European countries, and now that's slowly changing. Quote, when I see President Trump announcing that he's quitting a major disarmament treaty, who is the main victim? Europe and its security. Macron said on a visit to Verdun, a French city that was the site of a major battle in 1916. Europe needs to be, pre be prepared to defend itself better alone without just depending on the United States, the French president added. And that's from uh, time.com, November 7th, 2018. It's been Israelite leadership that has preserved world peace for 17, 70 years now. And again, this is something for us to keep our eyes on. We understand in God's church that the last great power on the face of the earth prior to the return of Jesus Christ will come from Europe. Again, this is one of those things that I sometimes think we've almost begun to forget, but that has been our teaching and it still is our teaching. Uh, US foreign policy has a bit of a blind spot in Europe. The attention is directed toward China and Russia and the Middle East, but not that much attention given to Europe. Between now and then, there will be a pullback of the dominance of the world by the Israelite or the Anglo-Saxon powers, and there will be another great, much less benevolent power that's going to rise up in Europe and that will begin to dominate the world. It's something to keep our eyes on, this slow separation between the United States and Europe. We can expect it to accelerate. Point number four in relation to that is watch Europe. In, in particular, watch a central part of Europe. Watch Germany. Perhaps we've uh, speculated that uh, the big events will take place in Germany. Angela Merkel uh, has been the chancellor of Germany. She's a centrist. 
But in 2015, something happened that has begun to change the course of history in Germany and in the rest of Europe. And it's something that is changing the course of history in many other parts of the world as well. About 1.3 million immigrants from 2015 forward were allowed into Germany. And most of those people have come from the Middle East. And there's been a kind of a pushback in Germany. It's something we need to watch in the news. Many Germans have said, we don't like it. We don't like it for many reasons. The extreme right in Germany was a fringe group until a year or two ago. And all of a sudden, a, uh, an extreme right-wing group began to gather a lot of support in Germany. Auf für Deutschland. Please excuse my German. My German's not very good. Alternative for Germany. Uh, this group is now the opposition party in the German Bundestag because the two centrist parties, both somewhat in decline, have formed this coalition and uh, the alternative for Germany from the extreme right has become the number one opposition group. Brethren, we need to watch this. These are very, very serious developments. This is the first time since the end of the Second World War that the extreme right that has some echo of Nazism in the middle of the Second World War is present in the German Bundestag. Up until very recently, they were a laughing stock. They were a little fringe group, and many Germans said, oh no, that's impossible. There's no way for a comeback of the extreme right in our modern European nation. And then in come the immigrants and the pushback and the reaction, which is the way history often works. And all of a sudden, you've got an extreme right-wing party represented in the German government. A leader of this German party, I'm going to try to pr pronounce his name, Bjorn Hoka, famously declared, quote, Party, uh, he's the party leader in the state of Thuringia. He has been behind some of the biggest controversies. He once criticized the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, saying, quote, we Germans are the only nation in the world to have planted a monument of shame in the heart of their capital. The AFD moved to expel him, but then apparently changed its mind from BBC.com. Now, if you study what's going on in the right wing of the German politics, it's a bit of a mix. There are some people who are traditional supporters of the Christian Democrats, and they wanted to push back harder against the immigration wave in Germany. There are others who are still a little nostalgic for ger the German past. Uh, many, uh, will, many have said we can never return to what we had in the past in Germany, but some are nostalgic. And it's interesting, if you study where this is making a comeback, where the extreme right is making a comeback in Germany. It's actually over on the eastern side of the country. It's the part of Germany that was under communism. Uh, and ironically, this is not where the immigrants have come. But it, look at the map, and you'll discover it's the eastern part of Germany that was under that boot of communism for all those years. And a variety of extreme right-wing politics, reminiscent of Nazism, is making a comeback in that part of the country. Uh, that it's that the, the uh, uh, German men in e that some of those eastern states have voted for the extreme right party more than the centrist party. This is something for us to keep our eyes on, brethren. It is very, very serious. We don't know exactly how things are going to play out between now and then, but we do know what it looks like in that final stage before the return of Jesus Christ. Let's go to Revelation 17. Revelations chapter 17, Bible prophecy tells us where it ends up. It doesn't give us every little link between now and then. Revelation 17 and verse 8. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 8. Revelation 17 verse 8. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit looked as if it was gone forever, and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. This system keeps on coming back. Here is the mind which has wisdom, the seven heads of seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has, has yet, not yet come apparently in the, our future now. And when he comes, he must continue for a short time. 
And then it talks about the ten horns. Now, we know what it's going to look like when it comes onto the world scene. It will not be 27 nations. It will not be 28 nations. It's going to be ten nations. How do we get from where we are today to a point at which there are ten nations that come together and form this strong union that begins to dominate the world and persecutes those who oppose it? We don't know for sure how we get from here to there, but it seems it's a whole lot clearer now in the year 2019 than it was perhaps 10 years ago. Again, this is something for us to keep our eyes on. It mustn't be a blind spot for us. It must be something that we watch. Let's watch what goes on in Germany and in Europe. Point number five, and this has been in the news this week, the Middle East. We know from Bible prophecy that the Middle East is not going to be a place of peace until Jesus Christ returns and brings peace to the world. We know from what we've seen in the news just this week that a lot of the contention going on in the Middle East is between two competing branches of Islam. Iran, which had its revolution back in 1979 and brought a variety of militant Shiite Islam to govern there, and Saudi Arabia, which has sort of become the de facto leader of the Shiite nations, of the, the Sunni nations, excuse me, of the Middle East. And there have been a lot of loud declarations this week. I'm sure you read about the attack on the uh, Saudi oil installations. Uh, you noticed it at the gas pump when the price of gas suddenly jumped by about 25 cents a gallon at the beginning of this week. And uh, there were drone attacks against Saudi oil installations and a lot of finger pointing back and forth. Who did it? Was it the Houthis in Yemen or was it the Iranians? Uh, Mike Pompeo says it was Iran. We have evidence of it. The Saudis say it was Iran. We have evidence of it and we can prove it. Iran says, no, it wasn't us. We didn't do it. And not only do they say it wasn't us, but they say, if you dare attack us, we threaten everybody with all-out war. Now, what was in the news today, maybe you caught it, was uh, the fact that the U.S. administration is now preparing to ship more armaments to Saudi Arabia and to the Emirates to defend against Iran. We don't know how this divide in Islam is going to play out, how the Sunni and Shia divide will end. But we do know that it will continue to be an influence on the world stage. We also know that the Middle East is going to be the center of difficulties as we move toward the crisis at the close of the age. Let's go to Ezekiel 5 and verse 5. Ezekiel chapter 5 and verse 5. You ever read about the Iranian uh, athletes who uh, default, they refuse to uh, have their judo competitions with the Israelis because they won't compete in uh, international sports with Israel, this uh, a Shiite variety of Islam deeply opposed to having a Jewish state in the Middle East. Ezekiel 5 verse 5 says, Thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I've set her in the midst of the nations and the countries all around her. Jerusalem is the, was the focus of much of the Bible history and is the focus of much Bible prophecy from now leading up to the return of Jesus Christ. Everybody wants it. It's a beautiful city. I, I was there with a, a group of church members earlier this summer. It's just a very, very beautiful city. But everybody wants it. According to the Jews, it is the eternal, undivided capital of the state of Israel. According to the Palestinians, they want at least half of it, maybe more than half, depending on which Palestinians you talk to. Um, you may have, uh, according to the Roman Catholic Church, Jerusalem should have some Roman Catholic holy places because the Roman Catholic Church knows enough about the Bible to know that Jerusalem is the center of God's government and since the church is the kingdom, uh, therefore, the church must have a presence in Jerusalem. It's interesting, uh, the Holy See and the State of Israel took a very, very long time to establish diplomatic relations. You know when that happened? Around 1993, decades after the formation of the State of Israel. Why? Well, because the Roman Catholic Church, according to their own doctrine, is the kingdom of God on earth now, and they know enough about what the Bible says to see that the capital of the kingdom of God has to be in Jerusalem. And yet, 
Jerusalem was under the control of the Jews. So it was a very tentative, very sensitive matter. And they had to allow the Roman Catholic Church and others as well to retain control of some of the holy places. Everybody wants Jerusalem. We need to keep our eyes on Jerusalem and on the Middle East. Luke 21, Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, Luke's version of the Olivet Prophecy. Luke 21 and verse 20. Luke 21, verse 20. Jesus tells us here, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. One of the signals of the proximity of the return of Jesus Christ is going to be Jerusalem surrounded by armies. Matthew's gospel, Mark's gospel, both talk about the abomination of desolation, some kind of idol place there once again, as took place historically. Luke's gospel talks about Jerusalem surrounded by armies, and it's not hard to see why that will happen. Everybody wants it. It's a very important city for everyone. And then Jesus talks to his disciples, and it's kind of a trigger. That's when you get out of town. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the, in the country enter her. And then verse 22, a fascinating although rather chilling comment here in verse 22. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. It's not going to be a pretty sight, and there's going to be a lot of suffering centering on Jerusalem in those days of vengeance. How does that all play out? Again, something for us to keep our eyes on. Let's go to Daniel chapter 11. We're just covering some basics here. Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 40. Now, we've talked about this a lot in our publications, but Daniel chapter 11 talks about this historical battle between the king of the north and the king of the south. They were both um, parts of the Greek empire, one based in Syria and one based in Egypt historically. But in Daniel 11 and verse 40, there's what, what uh, commentators refer to as a prophetic time lag. And we something, suddenly jump up to the last days. Daniel 11 verse 40 says, At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, shall contend with him, shall push at him, shall provoke him. Now, so there's going to be some kind of an alliance in the south in the Mediterranean area. And the king of the north, which we, whom we understand to be one and the same as the one referred to in the New Testament in the book of Revelation as the beast, shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and many ships, and he shall enter the countries and overwhelm them and pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. It's going to be technologically more advanced than the king of the south. It seems that there will be some kind of an alliance among Muslim countries south of Jerusalem and the alliance among Roman Catholic nations north of Jerusalem. And somehow or other, this king of the south does something to provoke the king of the north. Again, we don't know exactly what it is. It's something for us to keep our eyes on. We speculated, and I think it's quite a possible speculation, that it may be some kind of a terrorist attack, perhaps a terrorist bombing in a European capital I think that's quite plausible. We also speculated that it might have been the cutoff of the oil exports. Uh, it seems a little less likely uh, in the year 2019. Whatever the case, it's something for us to keep our eyes on and watch the Middle East. Developments in the Middle East are not going to bring any kind of lasting peace. The Middle East and Jerusalem in particular will be the focus of a lot of the end time events. So we've got several places on the face of planet Earth that we need to give our attention to. Events in Europe, events in the Middle East. And then in general, I'm moving on now, uh, in relation to this as well, um, something we need to keep our eyes on in Proverbs chapter 22. I'm jumping around here a little bit, but let's go to Proverbs 22 because this ties in with our modern situation as well. Proverbs 22 and verse seven. Watch what happens in the world economies. Proverbs 22 and verse 7. And watch the buildup of debt. 
Proverbs 22, verse 7 says, The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. You borrow lots of money, you end up as a servant to the one who has lent you all the money. Quote from Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell, who has repeatedly called out the ballooning U.S. national debt. He did so again while testifying to Congress on Tuesday. The, quote, the U.S. federal government is on an unsustainable fiscal path, Powell told the Senate Banking Committee, noting that, quote, debt as a percentage of GDP is growing and now growing sharply, and that is unsustainable by definition. He continued, we need to stabilize debt to GDP. The timing of doing that, the ways of doing it through revenue, through spending, all of those things are not for the Fed to decide. Powell later added that the single biggest thing that drives the unsustainability is healthcare delivery. We spend 17% of GDP, everyone else spends 10%. It's not that benefits themselves are too generous, we deliver them in inefficient ways. Quoted in finance.yahoo.com. One trillion dollar per year deficit. Some are saying it's unsustainable. That's a lot of money. That translates into a lot of money for every one of us and currently, the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. It has been for decades. The pound sterling, of course, was at one point. The dollar is the reserve currency of the world. There are moves on the world stage to put an end to that. That's not going to happen tomorrow because the alternatives are not there. The uh, euro is not a strong enough currency. It's got many internal uh, uh, stresses inside of it. And the Chinese currency is not convertible enough yet. So what do people trade in? They trade in dollars. It's the reserve currency of the world. And isn't that a good thing for you and me as we go off to the Feast of Tabernacles and our dollar goes a long way? And yet, there are moves to put an end to that. Vladimir Putin, earlier this year, June 7th, 2019, <coughs> the St. Petersburg Economic Forum, speaking at an economic forum alongside Chinese President Xi Jinping, the Russian president called for deep reform, claiming that trust in the dollar has been on the decline. Changes in the global economy called for the adaptation of international financial organizations and rethinking the role of the dollar, which has turned into an instrument of pressure by the country of issue on the rest of the world, Putin said. That's his view. Putin, whose country has chafed under numerous rounds of U.S. sanctions, has repeatedly slammed the global financial system established by Washington in the aftermath of World War II. In a speech at a plenary session, Putin accused Washington of seeking to, quote, extend its jurisdiction to the whole world. Interesting quote from trtworld.com. So something for us to keep our eyes on is what's going on in the world economy and the role of the dollar, which is still the dominant currency on the world scene. Again, Bible prophecy tells us what will happen before the return of Jesus Christ. We don't know what happens step by step as we approach that, but Bible prophecy tells us what will happen at some point in the future, and we find this in Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. <clears throat> and here it talks about the establishment of a, an economic system that is going to look very, very different from the economic system that we have at present. Revelation 13 and uh, verse 16. Let's pick it up in verse 16. Revelation 13, verse 16. He, this is talking about the beast in the last days, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name or the number of his name. And of course, we all remember the number. The number is 666, and uh, you perhaps have done what I've done, sat down with pencil and paper and tried to figure out who it is. We don't know who it is yet. But that's going to take place at some point in the future, and that suggests some kind of a breakdown in the world economic order. Will it be debt that brings that about? Will the debt burden in the Western economies in particular become so burdensome that eventually, as Jerome Powell said, it becomes unsustainable? Again, this is something for us to keep our eyes on, and I think 
it impacts all of us individually that we should be sure that we're not piling up too much debt as we're able. Most of us are not able to buy our house cash, but uh, watch our own personal finances because Bible prophecy indicates that there will be problems in the world economic system and things are going to change very drastically between now and then. Well, most of the news is bad news. Most of the news is not happy. But uh, here's my last point, and my last point has to do with where we are now. We're nine days away from the Feast of Trumpets. We're 23 days away from the Feast of Tabernacles, the first day. And as we watch what's going on in the world and we look forward to our church celebrations, we need to keep those things in mind. We need to be aware of what's going on around us. Luke chapter 21. Luke 21. Luke chapter 21. Here's what our Savior t says to us. Luke 21 and verse 28. Luke 21, verse 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. This is in the context of the Olivet. Bad things happening, but our redemption draws near. Then verse 29, I've always found this interesting. Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree. When was the last time you looked at a fig tree? Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they're already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. Something much better is coming, and you can tell from the fig tree. I've got a fig tree in my backyard. I've never had a house with a fig tree before. But something that's striking is how quickly it produces a crop of figs. Suddenly, the tree is covered with leaves and with figs. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. And then a little warning for us to take in as we approach the fall holy days. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will, it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. And then verse 36. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And that, of course, is our goal. To be counted worthy to escape these things that take place and to stand before the Son of Man. You know, we've all had a busy year. We've all had a lot of things that have uh, occupied our attention. We've all had a lot going on. But I think as we approach these full holy days, this is a time for us to slow down and to take a deep breath and to think of where we are. It's those full holy days that present to you and me, members of God's church, the real solutions to some of these very worrying threats that we see on the world stage. We need to keep an eye, eye on some of these things that are going on. The problems are fundamentally spiritual in nature. And when we get together nine days from today for the Feast of Trumpets, it's as well for us to stop and think, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is going to come back from heaven. And he's the one who's really got the solutions to all of this. We look forward to that time. And then the Day of Atonement, and that's uh, proof in itself that the problems are spiritual in nature, when Satan, the devil, the author of all the problems, is removed and he can no longer influence humanity for 1,000 years. And then when we go to the feast, let's do what I've recommended before. I find, find this very helpful. Make sure that we've got time to think about what the Feast of Tabernacles means. Take a little time, a little quiet time. Sometimes we can get so busy at the Feast of Tabernacles. There's so much going on. Dinners and dances and this and that and one thing and another and we stop and we don't take adequate time to stop and really think about it. I'm a child of God. God has put me on the road to eternal life in his, king, in his kingdom. And this feast represents the real solution to all of humanity's difficulties, the solution to the threat to the survival of humanity. I think it's important that we be refreshed as we come to these fall holy days, that we think about the meaning, take them in. Uh, we mustn't allow the feast to become a vacation with a religious flavor. We go to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. We go to look forward to and anticipate 
the return of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the establishment of the kingdom of God. And all of these difficulties, all of these challenges, which can seem so worrying, and are going to become more and more intense as we approach those last days, will eventually disappear. And something so beautiful and so glorious that it's hard for us even to take him. Let's slow down. Let's keep the feast. Let's remember where God is leading us. Let's hold on to our calling and look forward collectively to God's kingdom.